when the Fed starts cutting rates, especially if the stock market starts to, let's use the word wobble, then I think we'll start to see gold move back up. And we still own a little bit of uranium, but the only things I bought into were the big caps. So I bought the Sprott Uranium Trust, which is physical, of course, and I bought Cameco, and then and I bought one or two of the larger juniors. So oil stocks are very cheap right now compared with where they were five and ten years ago. And most other resource stocks are undervalued. Copper to me is far and away outside of gold and silver far and away the, 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 the best buy right now. The way to make money is to buy things when they are really cheap. And if you look at the resource sector now, you know, it is remarkably inexpensive. The first month of 2024 is pretty much over now. And uh, so far we've seen more gains for the Magnificent Seven US tech stocks. The US dollar index has nudged up and rate cuts still haven't come. So how do you see the rest of the year shaping up? Yeah, you, well, let's start with the last part. You said uh, rate cuts still haven't come. I mean, that's not really a surprise, and I, I don't think we should expect rate cuts, whether from Europe, certainly not from Britain or, or the United States, this month. But if we look at the United States, which is obviously the largest economy uh, and, and where a lot of other central banks kind of take their cue, to some extent anyway, um, you know, the, the, over here we have something called the Fed Funds Futures, so investors can actually, as it were, place bets on whether they think the Fed is going to cut or not. And March, the next meeting after after uh, this week's, the next meeting is March. March is more or less 50-50 at the moment. And, and, and frankly, that's the way I would put it right now, 50-50, whether they cut in March. Now, in my view... Uh, and not my, just my view, but, you know, it's clear that the Fed has stopped hiking. So as they say, when you want to get out of a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. Or when you want to cut rates, the first thing you do is stop raising. So it's clear that they've stopped raising. The question, the question is when and how rapidly they start cutting. I think there is little doubt, little doubt that they will cut this year. If they don't do it in March, the next meeting is May. I, I So I suspect that depending on what data we see between now and March, I suspect we're going to see a cut in March. But again, if the data comes in, um, you know, stronger than they expect, it's 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 likely that they'll they'll wait. But, you know, the their preferred measure of inflation is something called core PCE. That's for people who don't eat and don't heat their homes. Um, and if you if you if you um, take a three month average or a six month average of the last month, that's actually um, they're actually tracking at their at their target. So I suspect that we'll see a rate cut in in March. So that's a long winded answer, but I don't think it's. I prefer to be you know clear in one one way or the other. But, you know, most economists have two hands. Sometimes they have three hands. And I just don't think it's a, a absolutely clear right yet. But but I do think we're going to... The point is we're going to see rates rate cuts this year. When we see rate cuts, a lot of people think that's positive for the stock market. But generally speaking, if you look at history, when the Fed starts cutting rates... That's actually negative for the stock market. And, and it's not that lower rates are negative for the stock market, of course. It's the scenario in which the Fed cuts rates, a weaker economy, is typically weak, uh, uh, bad for companies, and so bad for the stock market. Conversely, mm. when they cut rates, that's positive for, uh, for gold and other resources. But sorry to sorry to stop you, but you say a, a weaker economy. But earlier this week, we got the US fourth quarter GDP figures in, and they showed that the economy is still strong with 3.3% growth, consumer spending solid, and uh, even business investment up slightly. So, so how do you reconcile that with the idea of a weakened economy? The GDP was, was a surprise to a lot of people. 
now, and including me. Um, let's not let's not forget that uh, in the U.S. they have this nasty habit of revising their monthly statistics, and the revisions are typically not good. So, and you can put any inference into that you want. Um, but, you know, unemployment data is a good example. Over the last 12 months, they've revised those job numbers down and they have a first revision and a second revision. And we haven't had the first revision for December yet, and we haven't had the second revision for November. But if you look at the revisions that they have done, that's that's they they've overestimated job growth by 470 thousand jobs which is obviously significant i'm not answering the gdp i'm switching but um but that's a good example to me of how when the reports first come out that's what that's what gets the newspaper headlines that's what traders are waiting for and what traders act on the first revision and then particularly the second revision three months later i mean almost nobody watches that it's sort of history and nobody cares and people i've heard people say oh yeah the 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 october jobs numbers were reduced down by you know 45000 but so what december's jobs are up and i say yeah but wait till march and then we'll find out that december's jobs weren't actually as high as they said anyway the point is if in in the in the revisions for the last year they have reduced their jobs growth estimate by 470000 which is just staggering. And so so what I would say is, yes, GDP was higher than expected. Um, there are some things that are, are positive about the economy, but there's some things as well that are negative. I mean, last month we had the Empire State, New York, the New York manufacturing number that just collapsed. And um, we can point to other things that are down. Manufacturing in particular is weak. Services are a little bit a little bit stronger. Um, but on the two other things you point to, or the, the other thing you pointed to, which was um, uh, uh, consumer spending, I, I, you know, yes, consumers are spending, but 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 if you also, but where are they getting the money from to spend? That's important. And if you look at credit card balances, credit card balances across the board from, you know, Capital One, which serves, tends to serve the lower income group to American Express, which, which serves a higher income group, credit card balances are up to 20 year highs. They're over a trillion dollars. Now, what people do is they use a the credit card they pay it off. They use a credit card, they pay most of it off. They use a credit card, mm, they pay the minimum. And those balances go up. But at a certain point, they can't pay anymore. And so you get defaults. And credit card defaults have shot up in the last year, particularly the last six months. So if you look at Capital One and Discover, which again are two cards that serve the lower income group, their default rates last month were both over 5% of their total balances. That is staggering in my view. And so when people say consumer spending is up, yes, but how long can that go on if people are using credit cards and not paying off their balances? How long can that go on? I don't think it can go on very long, frankly. Let's turn to the topic of inflation. And you're on the record as saying that you think inflation will remain stubbornly high over the next few years. But now that the supply chain uh, and monetary expansion shocks of the COVID period are far behind us, uh, and also given that you see consumer spending weakening, shouldn't that all be a, a damper on prices and uh, um, and a damp on inflation as well? So, yes. So the supply chain was double digits, and we've come down since then. When I say stubborn, inflation is going to be stubborn. I don't, I'm don't. i not looking for hyperinflation. I'm not looking for inflation to shoot back up to 8 and 10%. I just mean it's going to remain meaningfully, significantly above the Fed and the ECB's targets of 2%. 
And right now, the uh, uh, right now the CPI and the PCE are two point six to three point something. Two point six is still six is still a thirty percent above their own target. So thirty percent above your target doesn't mean you've 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 succeeded yet. I think one of the things that's going to affect inflation uh, going forward for the next six months will be the price of oil, because obviously the price of oil affects the price of all of the goods in the store. They all have to come from somewhere, and so the price of oil is is an input. Oil has been reasonably soft, I would say, for the last three months, which is one of the reasons that the inflation uh, numbers have come, you know, the CPI and, and PC numbers have come down in the last few months just because of the the decline in the last three months in, in oil. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's more than likely that the oil price will stabilize here or move back up, even if the Middle East doesn't doesn't escalate more. Um, because China's demand China's uh, weak demand was one of the reasons that the oil price was weak. China's oil demand seems to be picking back up again, along with their copper demand seems to be picking back up again. Um, and again, uh, uh, China's weak copper demand for the last year was one of the reasons the copper price was low. So at the very minimum, I think we can say that the oil price has been helping inflation the last uh, three, four months. And it's something we really ought to keep keep an eye on. Um, but, you know, I'm a monetarist. So I think inflation, as, as um, Milton Friedman said, is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. It's a growth of money and credit that fuels inflation. And, and I think we're seeing we're seeing the results of that um, now. So I don't I don't expect inflation to go back you know, to stay under 2% uh, for very long, which is the Fed's target and it is ECB's target. So, so you mentioned China, and, uh, and many people have said that the slowdown in China that we've seen over the last couple of years has, has effectively been exporting disinflation to the rest of the world uh, and possibly bailing us out of that inflationary hole that we got ourselves into after the pandemic. Um, so I, I suppose I have sort of three questions. First, as a monetarist, do you agree with that take that China's effectively exporting disinflation to the world? Or would that not fit into your framework of, of how you analyze uh, inflation? And right. second, where do you see the Chinese economy go next? Uh, and three, how does all of this factor into your broader forecasts? Into my what? into your broader forecast for inflation and growth? Oh, yeah. Um, no, I, I, again, there's multiple factors, and you're absolutely right. There's no question that what's happened to China in the last 12 months has helped depress uh, inflation, so it's deflationary, in, in, the, in the Western world. There's no question about that. Now, if, if the Chinese, and we'll get to that in a second, but if the Chinese economy reverses, then it will have the reverse effect. It will help boost uh, uh, prices in the rest of the world. Um, you know, I'm not a China expert, so I will I will bow to those who who know more about China than I do. But it seems to me that a couple of things. It seems to me that at the moment the Chinese government is wanting to avoid has been, I should say, has been wanting to avoid broad stimulus, monetary stimulus. And they have been instead focused on um, uh, helping, let's say, very focused parts of the economy, um, such as real estate, without a broad stimulus package. With the decline in inflation and the declining growth numbers in China, that policy seems to be shifting a little bit to where there's a broader sort of stimulus. I'm not saying we're going back to where they were a few years ago with very aggressive stimulus, um, but they can certainly afford a little more stimulus in the economy. 
Um, and I think I think we're beginning to see that change. And if we do see that change, then that will that will help, as it were, or increase. It'll be a factor pushing up prices in 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 Europe and in um, in the US. But one factor of many. But from the commodity point of view, and I know we're going to get to that later, then it's not just one factor among many. It's perhaps the most or one of the most important factors for for the commodity sector. Yeah, well, obviously, we'll get onto commodities a bit later, but um, let's stick to sort of more general macroeconomic conversation for now. Um, and I wanted to quote to you an article that you wrote um, at the beginning of this year, in which you said that you expect rotation away from the US and away from large cap tech, in particular, favoring foreign markets, especially smaller markets, smaller cap and value. So could you uh, elaborate on that and explain or predict which foreign markets you see riding this tailwind and, and why yeah. you see this happening in the first place? Yeah, okay, so don't let me forget which markets, but hmm. you know, if you look at if you look at the last um since the great financial crisis 2008-9, uh the US market has become really dominant. Uh, in a way that it wasn't for the 10 years before that. I mean, if you go back 30, 40 years, the percentage of global market capitalization that has that's attributable to the United States has been slowly declining until you get to 2000 because of growth in other economies until you get to 2008, nine. Then you started seeing um, markets recover, the US market recovering more than others and particularly, you saw multiple expansion in, in the US. So the US is now on a, on a valuation basis, far more expensive, both than other major markets and, and also other smaller markets. And so that multiple expansion has obviously increased the market cap. And so now the US, if you, in terms of major markets, the US is now back to about 80%, which is where it was, you know, 50 years ago. So, but most of that, most of that, not all, but most of that has been multiple expansion. Mm -hmm. And and as we know, if you look at the US market, um, it's the tech stocks that have really been, tech and social media stocks that have really been driving um, that multiple expansion, and particularly what, what's called the Magnificent Seven. Um, so basically, seven, seven, Text seven stocks in the United States um, are can, can are attributable uh, are, are responsible for. Gosh, I don't have the. It's it's around thirty five to forty percent of the U.S. growth last year, and they're actually representing about thirteen percent of the global indices. If you just think about that for a second, it's astonishing. So every time somebody buys a global index, you know, 13% of that is going into seven stocks in the United States. And so the valuation on these stocks, I think, has just become untenable. Uh, some of them have growth, um, like NVIDIA, and some of them, you know, the growth is stumbling a little bit, like Apple. Um, now, Apple has a great balance sheet, of course, so it's not going out of business anytime soon. But but certainly the growth is 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 slowing down. So the way I'm looking, so so that's the first thing. But but you know, seven stocks in the U.S., the tech sector in the U.S. and the U.S. is absolutely dominating global markets now. So in terms of the percentage of global uh, capital market capitalization, is far greater than it was 20 years ago. And in terms of valuation. The valuations are much higher than they were. And I just, I, I suspect we're going to see this gradual rever reversion to the mean, which will start by one or two or three of these magnificent seven running into problems. And the problems may be no more than running out of buyers. I mean, there's a point when you've got, you, you know, 10% of your portfolio in seven different stocks 
there's a point when you really can't buy any more of those. Um, well, we, we've already seen this week Tesla um, dropping by about 12% in one day. Tesla, of course, has been extremely volatile over the years, based mostly on Elon Musk's pronouncements and tweets. But yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, there's two things going on with Tesla at the moment. One is um, Musk wanting, you know, greater voting control of the company. Um, and the second thing that's going on is their expansion into, you know, coming, introducing a car that's down market, which might help their overall sales, but will clearly reduce uh, profit margin. Um, so, yeah, I think Apple and Tesla, in my view, are, are the most vulnerable. Apple, because of, because of, of, of um, sales in China, you know, where it's got strong competition. So I suspect those two are the most vulnerable to slower growth. I'm not saying either company is going out of business or anything like that. But as you start to see slower growth for a few months in a row, you know, some people are going to start taking profits. Some people have remarkable profits in those stocks and they're going to start taking profits. Um, and, and so I think we'll, we'll see a little bit, I hate to use the word spiral because that suggests, you know, a collapse, but we'll see a little bit of a shift out of several of the, and perhaps all of the Magnificent Seven, um, into things that are, um, into things that are, are less expensive. As I say, typically when you see the Fed start to cut rates in history, you go back uh, the last five or six times they've started to cut rates, that's actually a negative initially for the stock market. If I'm right about a, a recession and if I'm right about an inflationary recession, namely stagflation, and a stagflation doesn't have to mean that, you know, inflation starts moving up dramatically. It just means it remains high and perhaps moves up a bit to three, three and a half, four percent. If you have a stagflation, then typically developed stock markets do badly. So the U.S. will start, the S&P, the Dow will start to fall. And at that point, people, unless there's a crash, people typically don't look to get out of stocks in a slow decline. They look to rotate into other things that are less expensive. And so people will look at, well, what's less expensive? What hasn't caught up? Well, other global markets is, is one thing. As I say, the share of uh, global market capitalization is far less than it was 20 and 30 years ago. And, <clears throat> and, and emerging markets in particular. I prefer to use the word smaller markets because, you know, the, the uh, Morgan Stanley Capital International definition of emerging markets has, has moved down to some pretty small markets. But if you look at smaller markets, those are even uh, more undervalued than the larger developed markets. And then people will start, so they'll start to move some money into international markets. They'll start to look at uh, things that haven't moved and that will be, or, or are cheap. So oil stocks are very cheap right now compared with where they were five and 10 years ago. And most other resource stocks are undervalued. Uh, small cap value is undervalued relative to growth, relative to big cap. And so I think if you see a, a, a slow deterioration in the stock market, you'll start to see money shift into other areas. If the dollar weakens, if the dollar weakens, then more of that money will go into global markets. You know, people, when the dollar's weakening and other currencies are going up, is when people start to move money into other markets. Um, and that's particularly true of emerging markets or smaller markets. If you look at the emerging markets, they typically do very, very, very well in a period when inflation is stubborn, but the dollar is going down and, and global, global growth doesn't collapse. Um, if we have a period when global growth slows a little bit, inflation stays high, but the dollar stays high, then I think um, you know emerging markets will will continue to struggle. But and as are I there, see, are there, sorry to interrupt you. Are there any uh, particular emerging markets yeah. that you would throw your 
hat into the ring for, or would it just be a broad ETF of emerging markets? Well, we're, we're very much bottom-up investors. And so, you know, for us, it's very eclectic. But looking at markets, I would say, you know, a few. Singapore is obviously a super solid, uh, you know, they're fun- as, a, as a country, it's very financially solid. The government's finances are in good shape. Um, so I would definitely look for stocks in Singapore. I would look for stocks in Hong Kong, recognize because they're remarkably undervalued. Uh, the Hong Kong market, as you know, has declined to its lowest valuations probably in uh, I don't think twenty years now since the handover. And obviously, there's reasons for that. There's obviously a risk, the concern of China's growing influence in Hong Kong. Um, but the stocks are remarkably inexpensive. So we're buying in those two markets. Um, You know, I've been looking at Brazil and Argentina. Um, Argentina, because of the new government, we do have some positions in Argentina. They've done very, very well since Millet won the election. So I'd be a little cautious jumping in too aggressively at this point. And I would watch to see how successful uh, Millet is because, um, you know, he's obviously got an awful lot of opposition from Congress, from the courts, from the press, from the trade unions. You know, he's pretty much got everyone except the voters against him. Um, So he's having to struggle to get his agenda through. But I would look at Argentina. Um, But Sorry sorry uh, to interrupt you again, but wouldn't um, a declining dollar kind of be a double-edged sword for countries like Brazil and Argentina, because on the one hand, their debt is denominated in dollars, but then on the other hand, they're big exporters, aren't they? And all the commodities that they're exporting, like soybeans or or various metals, are all priced in dollars. So so that's going to be a negative, no, for those kinds of companies. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, of course, China is doing more importing, more trade in, in the yuan rather than the dollar. But, but on balance, the you're right, on balance, the, the um, commodity exporting countries, um, you know, when the dollar goes down, uh, the, the, the price of their commodities, well, the price of their commodities in dollar terms will typically go up. Um, Argentina is not so much a commodity export story, though. Argentina is really a story about the uh, reform of the economy. And 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 if, if if the government can be successful at that, so uh, you know the dollar has multiple influences on Argentina, especially as they're thinking of linking linking their currency, um, you know, abolishing the peso and just using the U.S. dollar, um, which would be a big positive for them. I'd like to put a counter view to you. It's pretty much okay. diametrically opposed to what you just said. Um, but I spoke to Ed Yardeni, the president of Yardeni Research, late last year, uh, and he was saying that he sees 3D manufacturing, nanotechnology, robotics, uh, automation, and, and obviously AI as forces that are going to cause a massive surge in productivity growth, uh, and that that will then bring about what he calls the roaring 2020s. So, so how would you respond to this narrative? Because if Ed Yardeni yeah. is right, wouldn't owning the magnificent seven tech stocks right now, you know, be like having shares in Ford when the Model T was just coming out? Uh, and why would you want to own, you know, a, an Argentinian telecommunications stock or a Peruvian copper miner or some other esoteric pick? You know, when you could be invested in these companies that are at the vanguard of progress, that's what Ed Yardeni would say. Right, right. No, I, I've heard the argument, and of course, Ed Yardeni is 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 incredibly smart person. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take him on. But um, you know, I've heard these arguments, and one of the problems is that the benefits of these radical transformations tend to take a little bit of time before they really you know, get into the economy. And if you look at, I mean, just look at the internet, for example, and everybody said, oh, the internet, you know, that's going to radically transform productivity. 
I I really have my doubts as to whether whether it's improved productivity. Um, and, and we don't need to get into a diatribe about the internet, but in many, many ways, I think it's made productivity uh, worse. Um, you know, I know in, in my job, in my position, I don't think it's improved productivity at all, um, on the contrary, uh, because obviously, you know, there's, there's, it's easier to hack into um, into the internet and emails and, and so forth. So I think some of these things like um, robotics and, and AI, AI to me, as it is now, is really just, um, uh, you know, it's, to me, it's not a radically new thing. It's just a progression of what we've, people have been using um, automated um, writing systems and automated music uh, arrangement systems um, and so on and so forth for years and years and years. So what people are talking about now as AI, it's not something dramatically new. It's just a progression of, of what we've had. But I think these things just, so so they do improve productivity um, in, in some ways, no question. Um now, do they do they also make people less necessary? So we've seen that we're beginning to see that very much in you know lo lower um, you know fast casual restaurants where people had difficulty hiring people, and now you know you go in, you press your thing on a on a computer screen, um, and a robot brings you your meal. So where are those people that we used to employ? So those people need to be, you know, retrained and rehired somewhere else. So I, I'm not sure that on balance, on balance, I'm not sure we're going to see a huge boost in productivity across the economy, certainly not without a commensurate increase in unemployed and underemployed people. There'll be there'll be huge increases in productivity in specific industries, no question about that. But across the whole industry, I'm not quite across the whole economy, I'm really not quite so sure. I'm quite, I'm quite flabbergasted that you could say you don't think the internet has improved your productivity. I mean, surely, pre-internet, if you wanted to know some relevant data point for a stock that you wanted to buy. You'd have to go to great efforts, wouldn't you, to find it out? Whereas now you can very quickly look up all the information you need. Go sure, on, no question about that. Well, mm. I think we talked about this last time. How in the 1980s I used to get the Morgan Stanley Capital International monthly. Well, it was just Capital International then, before Morgan Stanley bought them. The uh, Capital International monthly book, and it was like this thick, mm. and it would come by mail, so it, it, it would already be. 10 days, two weeks out of date by the time I got it. And that had all the statistics on every stock in the world. Now, I like that because not everybody had it, right? So it enabled me to have an edge. But, but getting back to your point, yes, I mean, certainly in terms of looking things up and getting data, no question it's, it's increased productivity. Um, the number of useless emails I get, but all have to be or well, not all, but most, have to be opened before you decide it's useless, uh, has increased exponentially. The number, just to give you statistics, I get over 500 emails per day, over 500. Some of them are garbage, some of them are spam, a lot of them are research, but 500 a day. I probably get about 12 emails a day from people saying, I sent you an email 20 minutes ago. You haven't replied. That's not increasing productivity. I'm very because... lucky that you responded to our invitation for you to come on to our <laughs> show then in that case. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think you know what I mean. It's, yeah. um, so an awful lot of an executive's time, we're not talking, and, and this isn't a derogatory comment, we're not talking about the secretary or the assistant or the receptionist, but an awful lot of the executive's time is now spent on dealing with nonsense stuff. And you can spend half an hour a day saying, take me off your list, take me off your list. 
but I've discovered that's that's like a woman's work in the kitchen. It's just never done. You know, you can never say, good, I'm off all the lists I don't want to be on because they just start again. So um, this, this is something you're in agreement with uh, Paul Krugman on then, no? because he famously said that the internet would have no more of an effect on the economy than the fax machine. Well, I don't want to be in agreement with Paul Krugman <laughs> on any. I'll have to find something to disagree there. Yeah, I thought um, you would say I that. Think the fax machine actually helped. I think the fax machine was was a big benefit. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's get on to topics yeah. um, that that are more in your sort of comfort zone, and that would be gold. So, what what do you think's been driving the gold price um, over the last year or so? Since since October twenty twenty two, the price has risen twenty percent. So, what's been driving that? Right. Well, first of all, since October twenty twenty two. Uh, the main factor driving gold, as you and probably everyone knows, has been central bank buying. Central bank buying has been at record levels um, pretty much every quarter. We don't have the last quarter's numbers yet, but up until the third quarter, it's been at record levels. And that's really what's been driving the price of gold. There's no question about that. And, 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 and central banks have been buying, I think, largely because of um, uh, you know, the U.S. weaponization of the dollar and the financial system, whether it's the, um, you know, the, uh, what do they call it, the SWIFT system and everything else, of the, um, and the confiscation of Russian assets, the confiscation, not through a court process, but just plain confiscation, that has caused a lot of central banks, as we know, to say, hmm, do I really want so much of my assets in the U.S. or subject to U.S. confiscation. And so the best asset that is is out of the system, if you like, is gold. So it, it's, it's clearly been uh, central bank buying that's been driving gold. If you look at other indicators of, of physical gold buying, you look at uh, the ETFs. Well, we've had net outflows from ETFs since October of 22. Even in the last month, which is astonishing. We've had net outflows from from global ET, global gold ETFs. So it's not it's not you know what we'll call regular investors that are buying. If you look at retail, good indication of that is coin sales. Coin sales are flat. Premiums are way down, particularly in in the United States. And so it's not been retail. So it's all been the central banks in the last. In the last uh, four months, really, since the beginning of October, we started to see gold move up. And I think the primary reason that gold has moved up since September, since October, beginning of October, has been a growing sense of a shift in the monetary um, framework. So gold, as you know, when, when the central bank moves from hiking rates to lowering rates, Gold always does. Gold always takes off at that point. It has for the last six times we've had that shift. And I think largely the move from October was the market sensing that we're close. We're close to that shift. We've had a couple of spikes since then on 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 the um, Israeli uh, and and then broader the Middle East situation. Um, but those have tended to be very short-lived as geopolitical uh, ge geopolitical moves in, in gold are typically short-lived. So it's been primarily the monetary situation. And, and what we've seen, I'm just looking at my graph here, excuse me, looking over, but since about January, well, since the middle of January, we've seen gold retreat. And that's been as the sentiment towards short term or near term and rapid rate hikes has retreated. So middle of January or early January, the Fed funds futures that I mentioned was 88% saying the Fed were cut in in March. It's now a little bit under 50% saying the Fed will cut in March. So logically, you would expect gold to retreat on that. So do you have a, a gold price target for 2024? Well, you know what they say, don't you? If you're going to give a target, don't give a time frame. Um, <laughs> I think gold is, 
first of all, I think it's definitely going to be up and it's going to start taking off um, when the Fed cut, when the Fed cuts rates. If we see the first rate cut in March, typically the Fed doesn't do one rate and then one rate cut and then stop. We're going to see a progression of rate rate cuts throughout the year, and that's what the Fed members themselves in their last dot plot uh, forecast. Um, you're familiar with that, yeah? yeah? In their last dot plot forecast, we're looking for a series of rate cuts. Um, so I always prefer to say, you know, the biggest factor that's going to say what is the what is gold going to be in U.S. dollar terms is what's going to happen to the dollar. That's the biggest factor. But to answer the question, I think by the end of the year, we are going to be, uh, let's say, firmly over 2100, um, meaning 2100 will then be a floor, not not a ceiling. You know, whether it's 2150 or 22, I, I, I don't know. I tend to be a little more cautious on prices than a lot of my friends. So let's just stick with 2100. But 2100 that's, that's pretty much stagnant from where it is right now, isn't it? Well, no, it's 2026 right now. So that's um, $5 higher. Um, you know, but, you know, a lot depends on, on what happens between now and then. Um, it really does. It depends how aggressive the Fed is with cutting rates and what the dollar's response to that is. Um but I do think if we get, I mean, okay, so let me, I said firmly above 2100 with 2100, the new floor. And if we see that, we're going to see the gold stocks start to react because the gold stocks reaction to price moves so far has been pretty modest. Um, and they're lagging, they're lagging gold uh, for most of the last year. They've been lagging gold significantly. So, yeah. I mean, we're so, only in January. So your idea then is that for now, it's central banks that have been driving the gold price up. But when interest rates are cut, retail and institutional investors are all going to pile in, are they? So what, what's the logic of that? Why would they decide in that moment to jump in? They're going to pile in and jump in, but they're not going to pile in immediately. It's going to be... Because people have been out of gold for so long, particularly institutions have been out of gold for so long, and generalist investors, it's going to take a little bit of a while before they come in. So I wouldn't use the word pile in. They might pile in next year or the year after. Um, but Trickle I think in, then, maybe. But, you know, history says that when the Fed starts to cut rates, gold starts to move up. And we've seen that, as they say, in the last five or six rate cutting cycles the institutions in the us are significantly underweight gold to where they normally are or traditionally have been um you know the the average gold holding among all investors is less than half a percent right now um and you know over the last 20 or 30 years it's been as high as four you know four percent has been has been the average so it's going to take us time to get back to four percent but i think when the fed starts cutting rates especially if the stock market starts to let's use the word wobble i'm not talking about a collapse but wobble and people start looking for other assets um then i think we'll start to see gold move back up and it won't take an awful lot of that buying you know, if we go from half a percent to one percent, that's going to have a very meaningful impact on the price of gold. And, and to what extent do you see cryptocurrencies absorbing some of that historic flight to safety demand? Because that same crowd of people that's slightly distrustful of government and, and talked about the Federal Reserve um, in recent years, that they've been co-opted by the Bitcoin bunch. And, and people talk about it as being digital gold. So do you think that this time it could be different because, you know, there's a competitor now, isn't there, in the in the gold bug space? Yeah. I would, I would say the motives, as you say, the motives of people that buy Bitcoin suddenly overlap, strongly overlap the motives of people who buy gold. Um, but to some extent, I think the actual buyers are different. 
Um, you know, I talk to a lot of my clients where the average age is 62. And, you know, to them, Bitcoin is something of interest, theoretical interest. It's not something they actually want to put their money in. Um, and even when I talk to my younger clients, you know, 40, 50 year olds, uh, they might say to me, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of putting some of my money into gold, you know, maybe 1% or 2%. Uh, can you help me? When I say, well, we don't actually buy Bitcoin. We, we can't buy Bitcoin at, this was before the ETF came out. We can't buy Bitcoin at the broker. Oh, well, never mind. It doesn't matter. So most of the people buying Bitcoin will be 20 and 30 year olds. And I think it's a it's a technology. Well, obviously, I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, but it's a it's a difference in comfort with technology rather than um, antagonism towards gold, for example. So at the margin, there's no question. There's no question that Bitcoin demand hurts gold, but I think it only does it at the margin. I mean, central banks aren't going to start buying Bitcoin. Um, I doubt very much whether most large institutions in the U.S., pension funds, insurance companies, um, I doubt very much if they're going to start aggressively buying Bitcoin, whereas many of them certainly hold physical gold or have in the past hold held physical gold. So, yeah, it's, it, it hurts, but it's, it's marginal, I think. Right. And you already mentioned that there's been this bit of a disconnect between the price of the gold miners and the price of the metal itself. So how would you rationalize that that um, <clears throat> underperformance by the mining stocks? Yeah, I think there's three main reasons for that. One reason is, as we said, you've got to look at what is the reason why gold went up over the last 18 months is the central banks. Central banks are looking for safety, insurance, you know, on the long term. And so therefore they're buying physical gold. The central bank's not going to buy, you know, consolidated Ajax. Um, uh, so that's number one. Um, I would argue, and, and I had this discussion, you know, with people six months ago and nine months ago, I would argue, although I'm a bull on gold, I would argue that it was the gold price that was out of kilter with the economic reality, not the gold stocks. The gold stocks were perhaps fairly valued, but gold itself was overvalued. That's changed now, I think. So the second factor is the stock market. You know, when when the broad stock market and particularly the technology stocks are doing really well, people don't look at things like gold stocks, things like oil stocks. Um when the stock market starts to, and, and the longer that carries on, then the less people start looking at other asset classes. So that's the second reason. And frankly, the third reason is, you know, gold companies, the gold stock sector has not served investors, broad investors, generalist investors. It has not served them well over the last 15 years. You know, you saw people, you know, the, the institutional holding of gold stocks started to move up in 2010, 11, and 12. And in 11, we had the peak in the gold price, the peak in the XAU, the gold stock index. And we had a, a, a rash of sort of um, uh, pay, overpaying for marginal assets as companies were pressured by their shareholders to grow. And within two years, within two years of the peak in September 2011, 75% of those acquisitions were written off. So if you're a, and, and the gold stock index, and we're talking about the gold stock at XAU or the GDX, they were down over 80% from the peak in 2011 to the bottom at the end of 2015. If you're a generalist investor, but knows a heck of a lot about Apple and NVIDIA, but knows a very little about gold stocks, and you see your largest gold stock holdings decline by over 80%, you see these massive write-offs, you, you, you get out of that sector. You say, I, I don't understand it, it's useless, I'm not interested. You look at the largest gold companies in the world, Newmont and Barrick, 
they are trading today at a lower price than they were trading in the mid 1980s. Think about that for a second. A, a, a buy and hold investor has had 30, 40 years where they have not, not made any money on major gold stocks. And so, you know, I think generalists are just a bit fed up with it. They'll come back to the sector, but it's going to take gold over 2100, the gold stocks moving up again before, before they feel comfortable getting back in. So I think those are the three main reasons why 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 gold stocks have underperformed. And and, most and if, of if, if somebody put a gun to your head now and they said you can only keep three of your gold stocks, which three would they be? Oh my gosh. Um uh yes, I could give you three different answers, but um I, I think Franco Nevada is super solid and and uh has come down a lot because of the mess in Panama. Agnigo Eagle, without a question, is the most solid, the most solid of the big cap miners. It's the third largest gold mining company in the world, but it's the most solid with the lowest political risk profile. Um, and let's say Wheaton Precious. So two streaming companies and one one mining company. Okay, but let me uh, quote from a recent article of yours, and you said. Uh -huh. From 1976 to 1980, gold stocks rose by 800% per the Barron's Gold Stock Index. From 2000 to 2008, they quintupled. From 2009 to 2011, it quadrupled. In just seven months in 2016, they almost tripled. So with those types of returns on offer in a diversified ETF, when the gold stocks do actually move, um, do you think it, it's worth taking the added risk of picking individual gold stocks or, or is just going in with an ETF good enough? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I would say that I would say that what I call an ordinary investor that doesn't know much about gold and really doesn't have the interest in following it, they will do very well. When gold moves, they will do very well in an ETF or 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 a mutual fund. I prefer mutual funds because I manage one, uh, the um, Euro Pacific Gold Fund. But in a in a gold fund or even an ETF, you will get the kind of performance that will make most investors perfectly happy. You know, if we see gold go to let's say we see gold go to twenty two fifty, which is you know not not an extreme not an extreme um, a prediction and that happens over the next let's say 18 months you know i would imagine that the indexes will see at least at least a 50 percent return but probably a double that's what we we've seen before so most investors will be perfectly happy with that kind of return i would argue though that if you look at the etfs you are buying primarily you are buying based on size and the weightings are based on size. There's not a qualitative uh, uh, criterion that goes into it. We're not saying which of the better ones, which of the cheaper ones. They're just saying, what is the biggest one? And that's going to be our largest holding. So if you look at the GDX, for example, Newmont, the largest one in the world is, I think, 14%. So when you buy an ETF, you're buying the good, the bad, and the ugly. And with just a little bit of work and effort, you can at least avoid the ugly and you can avoid most of the bad. And, and I think have returns that are far superior, far superior. Yeah, um, you, you'd, be, you'd be kicking yourself, wouldn't you? The GDX went up 500%, but you'd invested in, you know, consolidated Ajax that suddenly got a, I don't know, a legal dispute with the, dancing badger tribe or something and you know get absolutely bogged down in that uh, and you're left out of the rally just because you tried to be too clever sure and and of course i'm not talking about consolidated ajax i would look mm. at you know the best of the bigger companies i mentioned agnigo and and wheaton and franco and mm. you know you can go down down a bit to companies like b2 but are well diversified around the world, pay a 5% dividend yield. Um, 
But I think with just a little bit of effort, and I'm not allowed to talk about our returns, but anyone who wants to see a table of our returns can see how we've done compared with the index in those periods when gold has gone up. And not just us, but but other gold managers as well. And the returns from a good gold manager are, generally speaking, not just greater, but far greater uh, in, in, a, in a one or two or three year bull market. Uh, gold managers will typically well outperform. As I say, if, if you're just not interested, you don't know anything about it, you're just not interested in following it, you prefer to play with the grandkids, you know, a, a gold ETF or a gold mutual fund is going to give you perfectly acceptable returns in a strong market. Um, but I think you can do better by 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 weeding out the bad companies. Let's uh, move on to non-gold commodities and starting with uranium, because that's another case of a metal where the miners are lagging behind the, the momentum that we're seeing. So, so uranium's price has gone up around 100% um, over the last year, while the Sprott Uranium Miner ETF is up only around 40%. Um, and given that the miners are usually supposed to be a leverage play on the metal's price, uh, that's probably a bit surprising there. So do you have any position in uranium miners, or are you looking to add any? Um, right now, we have very, very little. I have to say that I got out of that sector far too early. Um, how how so, early are we talking? Um, I sold most of my uranium stocks in October. And, and pretty much the only things, and, and we still own a little bit of uranium, but the only things I bought into were the big caps. So I bought the Sprott Uranium Trust, which is physical, of course. And I bought Cameco. And then, and I bought one or two of the larger juniors. I think the problem with the uranium space, when you look at the miners, um, you, you know, there's 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 very few, um, you know, large scale producers that that you would expect to necessarily um, reflect the growth in the uranium price. So, you know, if you look at gold, for example, you know, you can come up with 10 major mining companies, but you would expect expect to more or less reflect the gold price, go down when it goes down, go up when it goes up. And, and in a stronger market, as you say, provide leverage on that. But with the uranium, you go down pretty quickly after you go to Cameco, Kazakhbrom, which a lot of people don't want to invest in or their broker can't invest in for them, a Kazakh stock. And then you go to Denison and, you know, you go down pretty quickly to companies that are looking to develop projects and frankly still need higher uranium prices before those projects are, are profitable. Uh, and I suspect that's really the reason that they've lagged. Most people, and I'm one of them, most people who a year ago said, I want to get into uranium, most people would say, well, let's buy the Uranium Physical Trust. Oh, and let's buy Cameco, that's the largest. I mean, most people didn't go down much beyond that. So I think it'll take, it'll take prices to stay above $100 a pound to really start getting um, awesome success, a new mine to come into production, and start producing profitably, you know, it'll it'll take something like that to, to get people really moving into the juniors. So you said that you sold out your positions in October. Do you feel now that it's run too far and, and you're staying away or are you eyeing up a re-entry point? Well, you know, if you, yeah, if you ask someone who sold too early, they'll always come up with a hundred reasons why the price is too, too, too high now. Um, you know, because uh, I don't want to look like a complete idiot. Um, no, I I want to be, yes, I, I think we want to be exposed to uranium over the longer term. There's no question in my mind that the world is shifting towards more nuclear. We're seeing that all over the place. We just saw the European Union uh, approve small nuclear plants. 
Um, you know, there's no question that we're going to move to uranium. It is the cleanest, um, a, 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 the cleanest, the most reliable, and the safest of energy sources. When I say that, it surprises people. But, um, you know, if you look at the statistics, it is a it is a safe industry. It's just when we have a problem, it's a big problem. Uh, and I, I the an, a, analogy I use is to travel. You know, when an airplane crashes, 300 people die. Every, everybody says, oh, my gosh, you know, um, plane travel is not safe. But if you look at the statistics, it's far safer than uh, using cars or, or even walking. Um, on a percentage basis, and the same with the same with with uranium. Anyway, so there's no question in my mind that we're moving in that direction. Secondly, there's no question in my mind that we're going to need more uranium to satisfy the nuclear demand, and uranium is particularly price insensitive. If you if you've already put twenty billion dollars into a nuclear plant, you'll pay a hundred or one hundred fifty or two hundred. You'll pay whatever it is. And it's, it's a small part of your overall cost structure, and you'll pay whatever it is to buy the uranium. So that's the second thing. And then, uh, uh, you know, the third thing is that I think we need a higher price to really get a lot of these mines of uh, projects that are in development to really get them uh, into production. Because even at today's price, uh, most companies, the margins are not particularly high. So yes, so we would be looking for a for a pullback. I think it's moved. I think it's moved a little bit too fast in the short term, and we will be looking for a pullback. But having said that, you know, I met, I obviously made a mistake in getting out when I did. Uh, when I buy back, I'm probably going to be buying back at higher prices than I sold at. But you know, that's life, as they say. And you'd be looking once again. To get into a, a physical holding fund like um, Yellow Cake or, or the major miners, would, would you? Would yeah, I'm, you I'm going to be, yeah, I'm going to be getting back into the physical to begin with because the physical, in my view, is the surest. Uh, Cameco would be one we'll get into, and then I'll start looking at some of the smaller, um, you know, going down the chain a little bit after that. But those two would be the first two I'll get into. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to, to read another one of your quotes back to you. You said, this was uh, in an article that you wrote at the beginning of this month, January 2024. You wrote, commodities are selling at 100-year lows relative to stocks. There's been a decade of underinvestment in resources, and that will play out with reduced supply in coming years. The setup for a strong multi-year broad moving resources is very real. So that is music to the ears of all of our listeners, I can tell you. Um, could you tell us, though, which specific commodities you see as being the best position to run? Yeah. And, and just before we get to that, let me just mention one thing, which is, you know, the interesting thing, and I only came to this fairly recently, um, uh, the, the most important thing with regard to commodity prices is not the current, most, most resource prices, um, is not the current economic environment, but it's um, this investment cycle is really important. Because if you take a commodity like copper, for example, a copper project can take 40 years, four zero, from a discovery to production. It can take eight, nine, ten years from applying for your permits until production. And it can take two or three billion dollars, billion dollars to build a mine. And they last for 40 or 50 or 60 years. So the point I'm making is that um, when you go through a long period of underinvestment and then companies come around to saying we want to bring more mines into production, start that process. They don't change their mind because the price of copper goes down by 10, 10 cents one day or 10% one day. Um, it's, it's a much longer term process, a gain that is reflective of the, of the investment cycle. 
so when I look at when I look at commodities right now to answer your question as to which I'm focused on, certainly gold and silver, certainly gold and silver because they're monetary metals and they will respond to what I see as the monetary of the monetary environment and the monetary outlook. But I'm looking more on the supply. Obviously, any price is determined by supply and demand, um, as well as uh, stockpiles. Uh, so obviously, you've got to look at supply and demand. But I'm I'm focusing attention much more on the supply side right now to determine which commodities I want to buy. So we've already talked about uranium. A copper to me is far and away, outside of gold and silver, far and away the, 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 the best buy right now. And that is because, again, we've had this 10 or 15 years of underinvestment and the, the, the lags from production decisions to production are at least five years. And so... You know, we, we we know with reasonable certainty what the supply picture is going to be like in three and five years. Or put another way, there's nothing going there's nothing significant going to be producing in three or four years, but we don't already know about. And so if the Chinese demand for copper reverses, as it appears to be right now, if you look at the warehouse. Uh, numbers in China. Um, uh, it seems to be reversing. We've had a period when when Chinese demand for for copper went down, which hurt the price. But if that reverses, we sim and, and the electrification continues, we simply don't have enough copper to meet that demand over the next three or four years without a higher price. So copper, far and away, is my number one. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there was also a, a supply shock recently, wasn't there, in the closure of a major mine in Panama. Um, so that's another well, you've had several factor. For copper. Panama. Uh, I think that was 3% of world copper production, so not huge, but still meaningful. You've had Cadelco come out and say their production is going to be lower this year, and they're struggling at some of their mines. And you've had Rio Tinto last month reduce uh, um, expert, you know, their guidance for copper production this year. So there's nothing I see on the outlook that says copper production is going to move up in a surprisingly in a surprising manner. But on the contrary, we're likely to see, you know, declines. Now, I, I should say, I think Cobra Panama is going to come back. I don't think that's gone forever. But it may take you know six months before it comes back, and another owner before it comes back. Um, but nonetheless, the supply shocks are going to be on the downside, not on the upside, in my view. So copper would be far and away number one after um, gold and silver. Um, but I think the whole broad complex is underinvested. Um, iron ore is probably very attractive right now because more and more companies and countries, including the EU, are demanding the higher quality, cleaner iron ore. And most of the iron ore at the moment is the dirtier iron ore. So the cleaner stuff is commanding a premium. Uh, so I think the iron ore price will respond uh, positively over the next year or 18 months. Um, and there's not a huge amount of new supply coming on. Um, you know, I, those are the things I'm sticking with. And I'm also buying, you know, some of the broader based, um, well, coal, I think, is still attractive. I think coal, the coal price has been way overdone. You know, we are not, for better or worse, we're still going to be using coal in, let's say, five years. And, uh, you know, some of the coal companies are very, very uh, uh, good value. Glencore, for example, which is obviously one of the largest um, uh, commodity firms in the world. Um, let me, you know, they just bought the coal assets from Tech, a Canadian company. 
Um, it's moved up a little bit in the last, let me just pull it up. It's moved up a little bit in the last uh, week or two, but that's trading at, oh my gosh, sorry, my Bloomberg's taking a long time. That's trading a single digit PEs, if I remember correctly. There it goes. Yeah, it's trading a seven times earnings multiple, yielding 8%. Um, and, and coal is only going to help them, frankly, whether you like it or not. Hmm. Um, so, so, so I so think some reasons. So let's let's just summarize then. So, so you said gold, you said copper, you said iron ore, and you said coal. Um, and uranium. uranium and uranium, too. of course. What about um, the platinum group metals, like platinum or palladium? They're, at, they're trading at very low prices right now. Yeah. Can I, can I bug out of that by simply saying that over the last 40 years, every time I, i've just always got platinum and palladium wrong mm. and so you know i don't know what it is maybe it's just a matter of odds but i'm missing something um so i'm not exposed to those metals at the moment fair enough well you've been very generous with your time i want to thank you again um for coming and sharing the benefit of your your experience with us um, is there anything, though, before we wrap up that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to mention? Yeah, the first thing I want to mention is I'm going to take you off my mailing list because you read what I say and you quote it back to me. That's not... <laughs> um, I, 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 the only thing I will say is that, you know, we all know that the way to make money, if you're a long-term a long -term investor, the way to make money is to buy things when they are really cheap. And if you look at the resource sector now, you know, it is remarkably inexpensive. And that was also true a year ago, of course. And so, you know, our patience can get tested. But if you're a long-term investor, um, you know, you just have to, I think you you stick with it. As long as, you, as, long as the, quality of the, the quality of the securities you own is good, you just stick with it and, you know, the rewards will come. And in the, in the commodity space generally, as you mentioned, quoting me on gold, in the commodity space, the returns can be very, very strong when they turn. And for most, most people aren't nimble enough to sort of jump on board once the thing turns. So you just need to be positioned when, when they're inexpensive and the returns can be very dramatic.